Thank you. Uh, so uh, we talked yesterday how, uh, how little progress there had been in, in AML, uh, particularly in, in older patients. And uh, CML is exactly the opposite. In, in the last decade, uh, treatment has, has turned uh, 180 degrees uh, from what it was uh, uh, previously. Um, more than a decade ago, allogeneic stem cell transplant was the only cure for, for CML and the only treatment that could provide uh, a durable, durable disease control. And it was a fatal disease where patients usually died within three to five years from the time of diagnosis. So with the advent of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, this has dramatically changed. And so that, uh, as you heard already, that uh, frontline treatment with the TKIs is clearly the standard of care. But 30 to 40 percent of patients uh, either can't tolerate or don't respond uh, durably to, uh, to their initial TKI. And so the question is, uh, now when do we consider transplantation in patients who have failed to optimally respond uh, to TKI treatment? So uh, we should remember that uh, 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 CML is a, a, a disease where allogeneic transplant is potentially curative, and it, it works uh, primarily through the graft versus leukemia effect. So CML is, is very sensitive to the immunologic effect of allogeneic T cells. And we can even cure the disease with donor lymphocyte infusions for patients who had recurred after the transplant, showing that the T cells by, by themselves with no chemotherapy can, in fact, eradicate uh, this disease when it recurs post-transplant. Uh, there is long-term survival. You've seen this slide already that there is a 20-year follow-up uh, with allogeneic transplants. And there's actually two interesting aspects to this, this curve, is that you can see there are 20-year disease-free survivors in, a, in about half or so of patients, but you can see it's not really a flat line. There still is a, a continuing relapse rate in patients even beyond the first five years. And so that, uh, that persistence of a disease, even in allogeneic transplants, is something that we need to watch for. Uh, these people can be treated. They can get donor lymphocyte infusions and be converted back into complete remission, but clearly we need to keep, keep our eyes on them. The, uh, with, uh, Allogeneic transplants, the results in a more recent time frame are clearly improved. This is the results from uh, the Seattle program using high-dose busulfan and cyclophosphamide in an allogeneic transplant. And you can see excellent uh, results, uh, uh, better than 80 percent disease-free survival. But this is a you know, very aggressive high-dose uh, therapy. And the, the question is, can we do just as well with a non-myeloblative approach or a reduced-intensity approach? And I'll, I'll come back to that here in a moment. You've heard a lot about uh, mutations and, uh, and resistance to TKI therapies. I won't, uh, I won't uh, spend time uh, repeating what's already been, been described, but the one, uh, one thing uh, for sure is, is that, at least currently, there is no commercially available treatment that can treat uh, patients with a T315I mutation that is resistant to the commercially available uh, uh, TKI uh, drugs. And that allogeneic transplant is the one treatment that's been documented to be effective in these patients. We, we've uh, published a small series from MD Anderson where the patients seem to do just as well for the disease stage as, as they do with uh, people without the T315I mutation. And clearly, a patient who has failed imatinib or a TKI who has this mutation, right now this, uh, the treatment of choice is to go, go forward with an allogeneic transplant. So one of the questions that was, well, does the previous treatment with a TKI uh, make your outcome with transplant worse or, or not? That was one of our concerns in, in the beginning. Uh, and so we looked at the, in the uh, CIBMTR database at patients who had with CML who had gotten an allogeneic transplant without ever receiving a TKI that, or imatinib, so I am minus here on, on this slide, um, compared to people who had received prior treatment with imatinib. And then, went on to an allogeneic transplant. And uh, uh, fortunately, uh, we see actually uh, the opposite is true. You know, we were concerned that maybe imatinib failures would do worse with an allogeneic transplant. In fact, they're doing a little bit better uh, for reasons that are not totally clear. Maybe that the depletion of, uh, of CML uh, cells by the imatinib you know, prior to the transplant, in fact, led to an improved transplant outcome. And this was true really uh, no matter why um, people went on to the transplant. Sometimes they got imatinib and then with, were planned to get a transplant. They were just sort of waiting to get the transplant organized. Uh, but others uh, had either intolerance to imatinib or had failed to respond. And you can see the results are about the same, whether or not it was just planned and you went straight forward or, or you had imatinib failure. <clears throat> 
So the concerns about allogeneic transplant is the toxicity of the treatment, uh, treatment-related mortality, and, and the long-term uh, concerns about chronic graft versus host disease and chronic uh, morbidity related to the transplant. So clearly, in my mind at least, if you can be controlled with a TKI, that's some, even with the toxicities of those drugs, it's less of a risk, less of a burden for the patients than dealing with the potential transplant-related uh, complications. But uh, so what we've tried to do at MD Anderson is see if we can make the transplant safer uh, for patients. Could we use less toxic, uh, reduced intensity uh, preparative regimens, uh, hopefully achieving rapid without graft versus host disease, and then modulate uh, immunity to enhance graft versus leukemia effects? So we've done uh, a reduced intensity non myeloablative transplant that alone is uh, most of the time does not cure the patient. And then after the transplant, if, if we can detect residual disease, we can give donor lymphocyte infusions, we can even give TKIs, or we can do uh, vaccine-type strategies um, in an investigational fashion to try to augment graft versus leukemia effects. So uh, we've completed a, a, a program where we started with our non myeloblade or reduced intensity transplant, actually low dose, relatively low dose busulfate and fludarabine and ATG, achieve engraftment with minimal toxicities even in patients up to age 70. They then, if they've got residual disease, we could put them back on a TKI and, and ultimately give a donor lymphocyte infusion if they needed that to uh, achieve a, a molecular complete remission. And this has been, uh, been a successful strategy even in people up to age 70. And our, our, if they're in chronic phase or just with clonal evolution, 82% uh, of patients are, are long-term survivors. And if they had uh, gone into accelerated phase or um, a prior blast crisis and could be put back into a second chronic phase, uh, about half of people were successfully treated with this approach. And we have an ASH abstract where we've now looked at sort of our 10-year results. And people who are in a clean chronic phase without clonal evolution, uh, it's actually 95% uh, survival. If you've got accelerated phase uh, or are in a second chronic phase, you can see it's, again, about 45%. And if you're in blast crisis with, uh, in, and not back into a chronic phase, you can see the results are poor with 20% with survival. So the question you sort of have to ask yourself, you've got a patient now who's got CML, who's a potential transplant candidate, you, you clearly would want to do them while they're in chronic phase. Uh, you don't want to wait for them to be in an accelerated, overt accelerated phase or blast crisis because clearly the results are worse even if you get them back into a second chronic phase. And you don't want to clearly, uh, the last thing you want to do is treat them while they're in blast crisis. So the question is how do you approach the patient while they're still in chronic phase who have, have failed uh, imatinib or other TKIs? So this is, this is the, the cutting edge of the discussion at the moment. What should we do with people when they have their first failure? Should they get a, 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 another trial with a TKI? So if you failed imatinib, you've seen results in a previous uh, uh, presentation that treatment with a, a second generation TKI at least has good results for the first three years. So it's probably not unreasonable if the patient has is, is got low bulk disease, uh, who's, uh, who's been responsive to their initial TKI to some extent, to try a second line TKI and see how you do. If they get a complete cytogenetic remission, particularly a complete molecular remission, you're probably not pressed to go ahead with a transplant. But if they don't go into a cytogenetic remission, for sure you should go ahead, or if they failed two drugs. I think for sure you should go ahead uh, before the patient has a chance to, to go on to an overt accelerated phase or blast crisis. So these are, this is sort of the, the cutting edge of the field. What, at, at what point would we pull the trigger and say this is the time uh, to do an allogeneic transplant? Now another question, and we'll see what Dr. Seglio says about this, is what about people who have gotten a second line TKI as their initial treatment? How do they do uh, with a a second-line treatment when they've already gotten our, our more potent uh, TKI inhibitors as their initial treatment, and we'll see, uh, see how those people do as, we, as studies go forward. So, uh, so again, the main message is you don't want to wait until it's too late, and uh, if the patient is young and has a matched donor, is a good candidate for a transplant, you want to plan ahead and, and do the patients before they can uh, progress to an overt accelerated phase. Thank you.